who really made Naruto? Masashi Kishimoto is obviously the creator, but that's not quite what I mean. If you dig around the Naruto community long enough, you'll find claims suggesting that much of its success is due to its first editor, Kosuke Yahagi, not Kishimoto. Normally, this would be hard to discern for any given manga, but in this case, we have more insight than you might expect, and it turns out that these claims do hold some weight. I have navigated a minefield of misinformation, hopefully successfully, to investigate this. I'll give you some of Naruto's behind the scenes details and we'll try to figure out the extent of Yahagi's influence. I guess what I'm really asking is, who made Naruto successful? Or even, did Yahagi save Naruto? Let's dive in. We'll take a brief look at Kishimoto's childhood, since the story's earliest concepts stem from it. Naruto's upbringing is just an exaggeration of Kishimoto's childhood feelings of inferiority. He often felt like an underdog, always on the outskirts, not very good at academics or sports. He even grew to dislike people who were too… perfect. His hometown itself was an inspiration for the Hidden Leaf Village. Being right next to a Japanese self-defense force base led to ideas like the four-man cell and Konoha Special Forces. Like most mangaka, Kishimoto Kishimoto began drawing, watching anime, and considering a career in manga at a very young age. But he lacked support or encouragement from parents and friends. He still couldn't deny that he had some level of skill when it came to drawing. He's starting to sound a bit like Naruto, but there is one big difference that also impacts his relationship with his editor. As a child, I was very obedient. I never challenged the authority of adults, whether that of my parents or teachers. Their words had the value of truth, and I didn't ask myself any questions. He went on to Kyushu Sangyo University and studied art, still pursuing the goal of mangaka. As Kishimoto grew up, these three series heavily inspired his drawing style. He studied all of them very thoroughly during his university years. Dragon Ball had the earliest impact. To him, Toriyama was a master of graphic effects. Disproportionate, unrealistic bodies, yet everything's under control. Perspectives are correct, very detailed line work. He next discovered Akira. Otomo is a master of cutting, rhythm, and framing. He goes crazy with perspective, and Takishimoto is the best at drawing with the camera position in mind. This work has had a lasting impact on him to the point where Kishimoto still refers to it as an unsurpassable work. Blade of the Immortal is a newer one. Samura is a master of battle, someone who can draw tough fight scenes in awkward places like long corridors while still making it easy to understand what's going on. This was also Kishimoto's guide on how to draw hands. And Kakashi is Magatsu while Iruka is Manji. From year 2 of uni onwards, Kishimoto started submitting work to manga contests. Kishimoto's big break would be the one-shot Karakuri, which won him Weekly Shonen Jump's Hopstep Award. The reworked version of Karakuri follows a boy dressed much like Sasuke named Kiru. He's a member of an elite unit that deals with the threat of what are basically evil cyborgs. Oh, and they all have animal assistants who fight with them. I'll leave it here, but there's a very specific reason why it's called Karakuri, which you learn during the climax. This award was how Kishimoto and Yahagi would meet. The morning the winner of that award was announced, 21-year-old Kishimoto rushes to the convenience store. He immediately buys the new issue of Jump, sees his name in it, then throws the magazine across the street. He did pick it up though, he's not a savage. Yahagi would soon call him. Kishimoto accidentally hangs up the phone on him, but the editor calls back and asks, are you ready to try this professionally? From that moment on, Kosuke Yahagi was officially Kishimoto's editor. So the reality of the situation is that Kishimoto and Yahagi were both just young rookies at first. The editor did have about 2-3 to three years of experience at Jump though, we can't discount that. He was about 25, about 3 years older than Kishimoto. Neither of them knew exactly what they were doing, but that didn't stop Kishimoto from thinking that jump editors were these pros who knew everything about manga. Yahagi had confidence in his abilities and could make big decisions at crucial moments. Kishimoto on the other hand struggled with planning. He got into the habit of accepting all of the editor's suggestions and criticisms. To a rookie manga artist, an editor is like the guard to the gates of hell. You think stuff like, if he hates me, my whole life will be ruined. What was Yahagi's initial impression of Kishimoto? Compared to others at the time, his art was strong. It had style, but it was also really dark. His characters always had lines under their eyes. At the time, I remember thinking, why is it like this? What a waste. But then I realized that it was something fresh. Here's the road to Naruto in a nutshell. Note that Kishimoto was living in Kyushu at this time, still attending university. The Slice of Life Project Wandering Detour. This isn't shonen magazine material. The Ghostbusters-like manga Asian Punk. Resoundingly rejected at every turn. Some alternate version of Karakuri Kishimoto doesn't really elaborate on. I don't understand it at all. 
Pause. This time, I lost my eagerness. I became quite depressed in fact. Reality is harsh. Then one day, I received a letter from Mr. Yahagi. When I examined it, I realized it contained two full pages of pointers about how to draw manga and other advice. And when I got to the end of that letter, my eyes started welling a bit with tears. Here's what it said. You do have talent. Please keep trying. I had been depressed, but it renewed my determination. Back on the grind. This time, Yahagi actually visited Kishimoto in person to go through the next work. The outcome. This isn't really manga. A cycle of mild depression followed by renewed motivation continued thanks to that letter he'd regularly reread. Kishimoto had now finished school and still gotten nowhere. It was time to go back to the basics and restudy manga. Shortly after starting this, Kishimoto got the opportunity to put out a one-shot in the magazine Akamaru Jump. The one-shot version of Naruto debuted here in summer 1997. While they work a bit differently, concepts like a fox demon and transformation techniques were present. It revolves around Naruto's quest to make his first friend, through which he ends up getting framed for murder. There is supposedly an even earlier version of Naruto that was developed. According to the Kishimoto Fuji TV special, it was a story about a boy who regularly visits a ramen shop run by an old guy. It focused on the two straightening out their lives and would be a more emotional story. His editor did not approve and said something along the lines of, You're way off. You don't understand manga. The mission continues. A sports manga, Baseball King. It's interesting, but I think it's a bit dark. But I didn't know you could write the style of manga. You've improved. The Mafia manga Mario, also very seinen. This one eventually got published in 2013. Back to shonen with the fantasy work Magic Mushroom. Pause again. Yahagi decided to make some incredibly important decisions here. He told Kishimoto to stop making one-shots and focus on making storyboards for serialization. The editor thought that Mario was good. He knew Kishimoto had the skill to just go for it now. Together, they reworked Naruto, storyboarded the first three chapters, and submitted the work for a serialization meeting. Naruto managed to win while competing with two other ninja mangas. Kishimoto moved to Tokyo, and the two got busy refining the series. A particular manga editor dynamic has now developed between these two. The way this Kishi Yahagi dynamic seems to work, from what I can gather, is that first Kishimoto will make something, then Yahagi will look at it and give suggestions. A lot of suggestions, at least at the beginning. Then, Kishimoto obediently follows that advice, or in rare cases, they argue until Yahagi eventually gets his way. These are bold claims, here's my justification. We know that before Naruto started serialization, our duo had about 8 chapters figured out and revised countless times. These are really important since Jump tends to cancel a series if it isn't doing well within its first 10 chapters. Yahagi-san told me to focus on the main character in the first two chapters, and then to use chapter 3 onward to establish a rival and heroine and create a love triangle relationship between the characters. I'm not good with female characters, so I wasn't planning on this initially, but once I established the triangle, it became a lot easier to create chapters after that. I was surprised by how good that advice was, and that's why I tend to listen to what he tells me. Now what happens if Kishimoto disagrees with something that Yahagi strongly believes in? One time, he argued with me for 6 hours to convince me to take his advice. He's very persuasive, so sometimes I have no choice. Kishimoto attributes many of their conflicts to the fact that Yahagi actually has some sort of an art background. I have to have a meeting after I finish my storyboard as well. Before, when I would draw based on only my own vision, it would be different from Yahagi-san's and you wouldn't okay it. Because he can draw, he can envision the whole scene by himself. So it was normal for us to take time to align our visions. This is how Kishimoto's chain of ideas developed. Naruto came first, and with him came the theme of the search for acceptance. Then I needed someone who would accept him, and that person became Iruka. As the setting came together, I decided the village needed a leader, and created the Hokage. And I needed a teacher for Naruto, so I created Kakashi. But the idea of Sasuke didn't occur to him at all. I started drawing the manga without Sasuke, but the story didn't go anywhere. I thought, if I don't do something, the manga will be over in 10 weeks. This was when Yahagi suggested giving Naruto a rival. It's very strange that this did not occur to Kishimoto considering how common the rival character is in shonen works. But I think he would have figured it out eventually. Whether Naruto would have gotten cancelled before he figured it out is a different story. After a bit of guidance on the rivalry idea, it all clicked together for Kishimoto. He took the reins and developed Sasuke based on his twin brother, Seishi Kishimoto, who is actually a mangaka himself. 
To him, brotherly love and friendship were the same thing. Sasuke is Naruto's rival. Sasuke is Naruto's opposite. This essentially became a mantra for Kishimoto. He studied a variety of manga to really formulate his understanding of what makes a rivalry. Shortly after this, Kishimoto decided that the end of the series would feature a fight between Naruto and Sasuke. Next comes the other unplanned character, Sakura. Kishimoto believes he cannot draw good heroines, and the best he could do was a girl who cannot understand men. Regardless, Kishimoto grew fond of Sakura, believing her relatable traits made her feel human. Someone who's kind of irritating, but also well-intentioned. Unfortunately, that was all he ever intended this character to be. He was once asked if there were some secrets about Sakura's past we have yet to learn. She's a normal girl, so I haven't given it much thought. Yahagi generally likes Kishimoto's character designs, but his one main complaint was about the eyes. I was told by Yahagi-san that putting shadows under the protagonist's eyes is not shown in like when he took me in at first. I also received the advice, make the protagonist's eyes single-lidded, and make the rival's eyes double-lidded. In general, the development of jutsus is a collaborative effort between mangaka and editor, especially for the more abstract or complicated ones like the Izanami. The starting point was the standard Henge no Jutsu. From there, the team got Kage Bunshin no Jutsu and Oiroke no Jutsu. Then you keep amping it up from there. When I proposed the Harem no Jutsu, nobody listened to me at first. Yeah, keep fighting for what's important, Kishimoto. Generally, characters are designed first, and the Jutsu is developed for them from there. As well planned as the first 8 chapters were, things already started to unravel by the time Zabuza was introduced. Kishimoto's focus was on making the story feel exciting and suspenseful. He wanted readers to think that the world was powerful. Unfortunately, this came at the cost of leaving important story concepts underdeveloped. According to the Fuji TV special, this includes the Sharingan and the Kekkei Genkai. These were thrown in without really thinking about how they would be used in the future. The Sharingan takes inspiration from an old Japanese folktale, the Tale of the Gallant Jiraiya, where the folktale version of Jiraiya had a similar eye power. Yahagi did have to clean up the jutsu names before we got to this point. To him, they were all over the place, had lame names, and lacked cohesiveness. I felt that at the beginning of the story, it was better to have jutsu names that weren't too varied. Creating settings like the Sharingan or Kekkei Genkai, which would lead to the current developments, helped solidify the foundation. Sasuke's backstory wasn't very developed either. Kishimoto just knew he would have an older brother and that he had done something bad. Though to his credit, by the time we see this in chapter 16, he already decided that Obito would be an Uchiha and that Minato would be Naruto's father. I thought it was necessary, so I made sure to include the fourth Hokage's face on the mountain. Kishimoto knew he'd have to eventually reveal what happened to Minato, but for now, he was completely lost on how to go about it. Since Karakuri, Kishimoto had a habit of using talking animals as prominent characters. He originally intended the fourth Hokage's face on that mountain to be a dog named Kiba. It didn't seem strange since there are ninja dogs in Naruto. Why couldn't a dog become Hokage? Yahagi's reaction was along the lines of, Did you lose your way at this point? Kishimoto ran a fever through much of the Zabuza art, which made the whole thing an even bigger struggle. Enter Mikio Ikimoto with the assist. This guy goes on to become the lead artist of Boruto. Ikemoto relieved some of this struggle by taking on the designs of Zabuza, Haku, and the third Hokage's battle outfit, which was especially helpful since Kishimoto was also working on the designs for the Chunin exam characters at this time. Kishimoto originally made Haku a bear. Coming back to these Chunin exam characters, Kishimoto was having a hard time with these because he didn't intend to do this arc in the first place. What he wanted to do was have Naruto go on missions outside Konoha and meet other four-man cells from other villages in the process. Yahagi didn't like how slowly things would develop this way. We don't have time to waste. Let's introduce the characters all at once and do a tournament. Kishimoto really didn't want to do this, but Yahagi clearly won that debate. Kishimoto even asked his editor to handle some of the designs at one point, and in response, Yahagi drew Lee's draft design. He told me to watch old Jackie Chan movies and create characters like that, and some really weird drawings came back. Those guys became Guy and Lee. Out of all these new guys, I think Shikamaru might have become a character that Kishimoto's very fond of. He might even be his ideal person. I had troubles with him. I put forth a lot of effort and time to make such complex plans and procedures. In the manga, Shikamaru can come up with them in an instant. It seems that you can really see his intellect. Plus, out of all the characters in Naruto, Shikamaru is the one he would date. We see our second tailed beast in this arc. The entire story of these tailed beasts started out as a simple way for me to get the fox into my manga. 
manga. I loved Godzilla. I just wanted to draw a monster, something big I could place in a battle. That's why I decided to introduce the Kuchi Yose no Jutsu, the summoning skill that lets a ninja call forth the weapons they need, or call a creature to their side to aid them in a fight. Here's a little blurb on all of them. Gara took a long time for both Yahagi and Kishimoto to develop. His original idea looked like this. A 7 year old named Kumomaru who resorted to drug abuse to push his physical capabilities beyond natural limits. Yahagi came up with the name Gara, keeping in mind he was supposed to be a foil for Naruto. But the kanji for love that's on his forehead was Kishimoto's edition, which does actually appear in the name Gara. In shonen magazines, the enemy is supposed to embody a form of absolute evil. However, other series already do that and I didn't want Naruto to follow that pattern. Rather than focusing on describing the enemy, their power, and their actions, I preferred to detail the circumstances of their birth and their transformation into a monster. Kishimoto eventually started to enjoy writing this art. Things were looking good for the short term, and he'd even decided that Shikamaru was going to win the whole thing. Yahagi had other plans. Even though the Chunin exam was quite popular, my editor said, it would be boring to just decide the winner like this, so let's destroy the tournament. And that's how the Konoha crush happened. This is why Orochimaru was introduced where he is. You've probably put together that Jiraiya was inspired from the same character in the folktale, Tales of the Gallant Jiraiya, but Orochimaru and Tsunade are actually from the same story too. The idea of Jiraiya and Tsunade versus Orochimaru with this toad slug snake thing is in the folktale, except it's snake toad and slug magic in a rock paper scissors type of thing. While it isn't the most exciting arc, I remember feeling a noticeable increase in the quality of writing with the search for Tsunade. It seems like Kishimoto was starting to get the hang of things, and Yahagi seems to agree. I I figured that after the Tsunade arc, it would be fine even with a new editor. By that time, the story, paneling, and art were so good that there was nothing to worry about. Kishimoto seemed to be getting a bit better at planning ahead, too. By the time Itachi made his debut, it was already decided that he would secretly be a good guy. He would only commit horrific acts due to the circumstances he was put in. From the Sasuke recovery arc onwards, the amount of info regarding Yahagi's input decreases significantly. Based on earlier comments, this could mean that Kishimoto was making more decisions that he agreed with, but this is just speculation. I mentioned before that Kishimoto wanted to end the series with a battle between Naruto and Sasuke. I later decided on the details, little by little, such as whether they would fight each other as friends or enemies, their feelings and dialogues, while I was drawing the series. It seems likely that a number of these details were developed during this arc. He refers to these scenes as the conversation of Naruto and Sasuke's friendship. That brings us to the intermission between part 1 and 2, Kakashi Gaiden. When introducing the Sharingan, Kishimoto left it a mystery as to why Kakashi had it, even though he is an Anuchiha. He had elements of the storyline decided from chapter 16. One final but important thing before part 2. Kishimoto draws action pretty well, and this definitely influenced Naruto's success. I have an easier time understanding what's going on in these battles than with a lot of other manga. Even Kishimoto's longtime rival, Eiichiro Oda, is impressed by it. Kishimoto likes anime, which is why you get all of these effects you've never seen before in manga. His style of expression is incredible. He's also really good at making characters seem grounded, which is especially challenging with the tailed beasts. It sounds obvious, but it's harder to achieve than it looks. You have to know exactly where the body center of gravity is. Like if someone raised their shoulders, how does that affect the position of their hips and so on? That's why when you look at Naruto, even just the way he stands, he seems solid. Oda said it best, a lot of this comes from Kishimoto being a mangaka who studies anime. A habit that formed thanks to the film Akira. The fisheye lens shot of Deidara sitting on Gara. A triple shot often seen in Jackie Chan movies. The cityscape view with pain. Whatever this is. You really don't have to think about the lens or the shot, but I would like to consider things like distance, wide shots, and depth of field when drawing, but readers don't really notice that, so as a comic artist with a weekly serialization, it's pretty much wasted effort. Kishimoto mentions that he has the ending of Naruto perfectly visualized. I've already decided on the layout, text, and scenes. Not just the story ideas, but the visual ideas are solid. A time skip was put in place to assist in making the cast stronger, especially considering what they'd have to go up against soon. Kishimoto took this opportunity to modify the character's clothes to better suit fight scenes. Naruto, for instance, lost the thick collar to make his face more visible. He also got a headband with long tail so that it flutters and stands out during action. The story from this point on kind of feels like a return to Kishimoto's original idea for Naruto, only this time we have the Akatsuki in full focus. Each member has their own hidden motives which are even intertwined at times. Which is crazy, because Kishimoto's original plan for these guys was to be a group of monsters without human characteristics. 
basically just ten zetsus. In the real world, there are companies that hire mercenaries and take on private wars. I wanted to depict that. I thought if I created a leader to organize them, charisma would naturally emerge. So I decided to make a character out of that. That's Pain. Kishimoto claimed that Hidan was actually his favorite Akatsuki on the Fuji TV special. Something about him being like immortal and his masochistic tendencies was just really appealing. He was having a lot of fun with the Hidan Kakuzu fight, which even got a bit dark near the end for the typical shonen, at least back then. Kishimoto actually brought this up to Yahagi. We got a minor smoking, which seems to go against manga regulations, and a decapitation scene. His editor said to just go with it and try to get it through the higher ups. By the way, Kishimoto confirmed that Hidan is still buried underground by the final arc of the manga. He could have put him in the war, but didn't want more characters to worry about. Getting to what is probably the peak of part 2, I think this further exemplifies the aspect of Naruto Kishimoto seems to understand best. The rivalry between Naruto and Sasuke. I'll let Kishimoto explain explain what he was trying to do. Naruto is an orphan from birth, while Sasuke still has parents. Sasuke suffers from their presence before discovering that when they die, that he suffers much more because of their disappearance. That's where the difference between these two become more apparent. Sasuke criticizes the latter for his inability to understand the pain of mourning, because Naruto has never known the love of a child for a parent. And it's true that Naruto doesn't understand. It isn't until he forms a close bond with Jiraiya, who takes the role of a foster father before dying, that Naruto starts to understand what losing family feels like. But he experiences this too late to be able to communicate with Sasuke. Kishimoto then contrasts Sasuke's reaction to Itachi's death to Naruto's reaction when learning about Jiraiya, then confronting pain. Naruto doesn't let himself be controlled by hatred while Sasuke does. I developed this opposition in stages and wanted to take the reader by surprise. Naruto at first seems very emotional and instinctive, and Sasuke cold, calculating, and thoughtful. But time shows that appearances are deceptive, that the emotional and the thoughtful are not what we imagined. The pain arc was difficult for Kishimoto for this very reason. This is the first time Naruto really has to put in effort to forgive the enemy, and somehow concluding the confrontation through talking while making it seem natural is quite the challenge. To be completely honest, overcoming trauma like Naruto does seem a bit naive and idealistic to me. But I believe that this kind of utopia must exist and be defended in shonen. The genre must above all be a bearer of hope. Yahagi definitely did play a role here. At the beginning of the series with Pain, it took a long time until we decided that it would end with a discussion. I thought about it while I was drawing an action scene. But still, Pain isn't docile like that. I couldn't influence him that way as simply as I had thought. Yahagi left Naruto after the chapter where Sasuke awakens the Mangekyo Sharingan. It's very likely that his influence remained for the rest of Naruto. From this point on, we get to see how well Kishimoto can execute ideas without Yahagi. Though keep in mind that he's no longer a rookie either. The first taste of this was with how Kishimoto developed Killer B. In his mind, this character may not have even made the cut if his old editor was still around. Though Yahagi disagrees. I love that character, technique names included. However, every time I think about that speech, I think that it's difficult. But that's okay, he's glad 8 Tails was around to explain it all. The new Naruto editor would be Joe Otsuki, who I don't know much about, though he did appear at a New York Comic Con 2015 panel. The most valuable Otsuki insight from this panel was the answer to the question, what makes a hit manga? Certainly an important thing is very appealing and attractive characters. But if we really knew the secrets of making hit manga, you wouldn't need us. I might not have a job. It might not necessarily be a bad thing that we truly don't know. By 2010, Kishimoto has a decade of experience, is now married, and has Hi. kids. He wanted to portray his experiences of parenthood through the series. This was what inspired the scene where Naruto meets his mother, near the beginning of the war arc. He wanted him to understand parental love. The fourth shinobi world war is probably the most controversial part of the series. This is an arc that Kishimoto wanted, and he applied the teachings of his grandfather who went through war himself. I was trying to let them experience a war once and then come up with an answer. Well, because of that, I felt like I couldn't escape from depicting the war. I thought I had to draw it, and various things that I hadn't been able to do unexpectedly, I wanted to wrap them all up here. The Mifune and Hanzo fight was one of them. The obligatory old man versus old man fight every traditional shonen needs. Though when talking about it in the Fuji TV special, Kishimoto seems very aware that young readers probably didn't care about this, and he should have really gotten Naruto out there as quickly as possible. The second Mizukage is there, 
Kishimoto just thought it would be interesting if there was a character that told you how to defeat him and wanted to be defeated quickly. The use of the Edo Tensei though was interesting. This was Kishimoto's solution to dealing with Naruto after the pain arc. Naruto could no longer just defeat, beat up, or kill an opponent to resolve things. Since I had already done something you usually shouldn't do in a shonen manga by ending conflicts through dialogue, from then on, any enemies he fought had to be entities like zombies, things that weren't truly alive. That way, he could defeat them without crossing that line. This is also why we have Zetsu clones around. He once again shows solid comprehension of this rivalry thing by not bringing back Jiraiya through Edo Tensei. He says doing so would have undone the part of Naruto's development that brought him closer to understanding Sasuke. And of course, the Edo Tensei was meant to be the hook that would draw Madara out. During the Fuji TV special, Kishimoto was straight up asked why Neji had to die. I had decided on Hinata as the heroine a long time ago, so I wanted elements that would bring Naruto and Hinata closer. Because of that, Neji ended up being, well, you could say, a trigger. That's right, as sort of a cupid to bring Naruto and Hinata together. This is also when Kishimoto came up with the name Boruto. It means bolt and is a reference to Neji, which means screw. By the way, every confirmed fake interview I found revolves around spreading misinformation about this love rectangle. I guess anime fans will always be insane when it comes to shipping. Haguya. I don't even know man. In 2008, Kishimoto said this, Madara being the final villain is yet to be seen, and I can't let that information out just yet. But he will play a big part as a final villain, that's for sure. That's all I got. That brings us to the final fight. Despite hitting the rivalry angle well, Kishimoto admits that he still had trouble with Sasuke all the way through the series. But he did know that Sasuke had to reach this vision that's been in his mind for years. At the end, I really didn't want it to be some battle between men resolved with ninja techniques or something like that. I wanted it to be more of a direct confrontation, where they're gradually exhausted and end up just punching each other. That's what I consider youth in Jump. He had them each lose their dominant arms so that they could no longer form the seal of reconciliation. It didn't feel like the right approach for these two. So the seal of reconciliation, which represents Indra and Ashura's conflict, is symbolized by the overlapping hands of Madara and Hashirama. For completeness, I need to mention these two movies. For the last Naruto the movie, Kishimoto was in a supervising role. He did not write for this. For Boruto, Naruto the movie, Kishimoto was involved in and led every step of the screenplay writing process. Make of that what you will. Kishimoto went on to write the sci-fi samurai series he'd been wanting to since university, Samurai 8. I guess that can behave as an example of what Kishimoto can do with absolutely no involvement from Yahagi. So that's the gist of it. What do you think? Did Yahagi save Naruto? Was he the reason it was successful? Wanna learn more about mangakas and editors? Check these out, and stay tuned for more.